Hi class, welcome to Advantage. My name is Dr. Scott Adamson, and this message or this lesson today is for Calculus I students who maybe have been studying derivatives, who have come to the place where you're studying the derivative of the sine of x function. And perhaps in your class or just in your own thinking right now, you might have memorized that the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x and you just gone on with your life. But I think as a thinking human being, you should have an experience where you've considered, why does it make sense that the derivative of sine of x should be cosine of x? So first, we are gonna take a look at Desmos. We're gonna look at a graphical representation. We're gonna examine the rate at which the sine of x function is changing graphically. And we'll see if this idea of the derivative being cosine of x does indeed make sense. We begin exploring the idea of taking the derivative of the sine of x function by looking at its graph and thinking about the rate at which this function is increasing or decreasing as our input quantity increases. So for example, focus your attention right here at x equals zero. What we're gonna be tracking is not the function outputs themselves, but rather our output value is gonna be the rate at which the function is changing right here. That is the slope of the function right here. So if we can imagine increasing x by a little bit, y will increase by a little bit, and we see right in here with the grid on Desmos, you can clearly see that if we increase x by one uh, unit here, the y is gonna increase by one unit. And so we're seeing a rate of change here of about one to one, about a rate of one. So let's see if that makes sense in terms of what Desmos will produce. Notice here in blue, I'm gonna graph the definition of derivative. f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And part of that definition also is the limit as h approaches zero. And so notice I can adjust h to be as close to zero as I desire. I will make it about that close to zero. So let's see what happens. I think that the slope at zero should be around one. It looks like we're seeing a one to one ratio there for the slope, let's see. And indeed, we see there in blue, Desmos is plotting as an output the rate at which this function is changing. Now let's continue thinking. As x increases, the rate at which this function is increasing is changing, but very slightly. If you look in here, it looks like that one-to-one -one ratio. If you look in here, it's maybe just slightly less than one-to-one. -one. And then you look in here, it's even slightly less, more less than one-to-one. -one. Now in here, it's clearly less than one-to-one. -one. So the derivative function in blue is a decreasing function, and we'll see that as x increases, the rate at which the function sine of x increases is decreasing. Now the rate is still positive, but the rate is less and less positive as x increases until when we reach an input value such that this function is at its maximum. Right in here, if we increase x by just a little bit, the function barely changes at all. And so at the peak here of this function, the rate of change, the derivative function, should be at zero, which certainly it is. And we continue. To the right, the rate of change now is negative. If we increase our input quantity x, our output quantity y drops. So we have a negative rate of change, slight negative, more negative, more negative. And right in here, it's as steeply negative as we're gonna see. And so we'll see the blue function tend towards this negative rate of change, more and more and more negative until just where we thought we reach the most negative rate of change we will see. At which point, the rate of change is still negative, but less negative, less negative, less negative, less negative, until right here at this valley, we see again a rate of change of zero. So the blue function should now, while still um, indicating a negative rate of change, will be less negative, less negative, less negative, and then zero. And then that pattern just continues. This is a periodic or cyclical function. And so that same behavior of positive, most positive rates of change, positive but less positive rate of change to zero, negative and then more negative rates of change, et cetera, 
that pattern will continue indefinitely. And so what we observe here in blue, if you're familiar with your trigonometric functions, this blue function resembles a cosine function. Let's do a quick check and see. And I hope you can see now in orange, certainly, we do have a cosine function. Now keep in mind that limit as h approaches 0. Notice that as h approaches 0, that rate of change function gets closer and closer and closer and closer to behaving just like that cosine function. So we have some evidence here graphically that the derivative of the sine of x function sure should be a cosine of x function. But let's go explore it more formally and see if that result is confirmed. So certainly, after working with the Desmos, you've seen that the derivative of sine of x, the rate at which the sine of x function changes, certainly appears to be changing in such a way that it matches the cosine function. So yeah, we can make a claim that if f of x equals sine of x, the derivative of f of x should be cosine of x. And that graphical evidence is very strong and compelling evidence. But it's not a formal mathematical justification of that fact. And so we're going to continue on with proving that or justifying that fact by going back to our limit definition of derivative. So from a previous video, you can um, make sense of or be get an opportunity to make sense of why this formula makes sense. Hopefully you're already there, but we're gonna start there as our definition of derivative, and we're gonna apply it in the case of the function sine of x. It would go like this. So we need the limit as h approaches zero, f of x plus h. So if we input x plus h into this function, the output will be the sine of x plus h minus f of x. If, if we input x into this function, then we get sine of x. That is the function. f of x is the sine of x. And then all of that gets divided by h. Now, at this stage, we have to have a little um, conversation about what this really means. There is no multiplication in here. This is the sine of an angle measure in radians. That is some angle measure x plus a little bit more. The sine of x plus a little bit more. This sum of two angle measures and the sine of that has a special um, relationship that we need to remind you of. To continue our process of justifying the derivative of sine of x, we have to have a, I'm going to call it fun fact number one, the sine of a sum of two angles. Now back in our context, we're gonna have some independent angle measure, some input quantity that's an angle measure in radians, increased by a little tiny bit, another tiny bit of angle measure. And from a past trigonometry experience, you may recall, or if not, trust me, this is fun fact number one, the sine of a sum of two angles is the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle, which is gonna be really small plus the cosine of the original angle times the sine of that second angle, which again is really small. So we're gonna take this fun fact number one and bring it back to our justification. So sine of a sum is, has an identity that we need to use in this moment. The sine of x plus h is equivalent to the sine of x times the cosine of h plus the cosine of x times the sine of h, that's the same as the sine of x plus h. We still have minus the sine of x, and we still have to divide all of that by h. Now, keep in mind that at this moment, we are eventually going to think about h going to zero, but we can't think about that now because if h is really, really, really small, we're dividing by really, really small, so we have to do some more algebraic manipulations to get to a place where we can actually evaluate this limit. So let's keep going. I'd like you to notice that this first term, sine of x, cosine of h, and this last term, sine of x, have a common factor of sine of x, which will be useful to us if we rearrange this a little bit. So the numerator, I'm gonna rearrange equivalently as the, cosine, uh, the sine of x times the cosine of h. I'm gonna bring the minus sine of x in next 
and then have the plus cosine x sine h. And this is really just for convenience so we can make some algebraic moves to eventually evaluate this limit. And the next algebraic move we're going to make is in those first two terms we have that common factor of sine of x. Let's factor it out. Now if we factor out sine of x from this product, we'll get be left with the cosine of h. And if we factor out sine of x from sine of x, we're left with just the minus 1. We still have our plus cosine x sine h, and all of that is being divided by h. Now, just to help visualize this, just to see more about what's happening so we can eventually evaluate this limit, we're going to make one more algebraic move, and that is we're going to distribute over division. We'll distribute our two terms. Notice we have this product, the sine of x times cosine h minus 1, plus this product. So we'll divide both of those terms by h. That'll leave us with sine of x, cosine of h minus 1 divided by h, and then that term divided by h. Now, focus on the limit. It's h that's approaching 0. So the, the parts of this that really matter in terms of the limit are this and this. And there is this property of limits that says we're allowed to, instead of the limit of this product of sine of x times this stuff, we can instead say sine of x times the limit of this part of the product that involves h approaching 0. Likewise, in this product over here, the sine of h over h is really going to be impacted by that limit. The cosine of x, not so much. So we can say cosine of x times the limit We're going to have two limits that we can evaluate. So we have those limits. And in previous videos, this is uh, Understanding Limits Part 5 and Understanding Limits Part 6. Go back and watch those videos. And in those videos, we make a case for this. As, as h approaches 0, cosine h minus 1 all over h approaches 0. And as h approaches 0, sine of h all over h approaches 1. So at this moment, trust me that those are true. Go watch those videos if you need to understand why those are true. But we're going to use these two fun facts to come back and finish up our justification. So using those two limits that we have previously studied, we now have sine of x being multiplied by this limit. And we know that that limit, as h approaches 0, cosine h minus 1 all over h also approaches 0. Plus, we have cosine of x times, as h approaches 0, sine of h over h approaches 1. And now the, re the result just kind of falls in place. Sine of x times 0 is 0, plus cosine of x times 1 is cosine of x. And so just as we predicted, the derivative of the sine of x function is indeed the cosine of x function, as we saw graphically, and now we've seen it based on the limit definition of derivative.